let's rock and roll welcome on the show jamie cheers appreciate it excited to be here ah cheers cheers how you been yeah fantastic uh a bit just back from sunny california but very oh, happy to be okay. back in new zealand nice 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 all right before we sort of get into the nitty-gritty a lot of people don't really that you know they see your success and you being this young entrepreneur but they don't really see how it started could you sort of explain this whole the your whole empire how you started this Yes, for sure. So I guess the adventure started really in high school where um, I was thinking about where I wanted to go after university. And in my early years, I was always told you should go into you know medicine, engineering or law or maybe commerce if you're quite academic. And so I was always just following this path thinking, okay, I might be able to do medicine. When I was about 15 or 16, I picked up economics for the first time and I started sort of realizing that, you know, while I like the sciences quite a bit, I don't think I really loved it. And, you know, my mum was involved in business and um, I was reading more about different businesses and, you know, entrepreneurs and stuff. And I got more and more curious. I did the Young Enterprise Scheme when I was uh, 17. And then um, I guess uh, this idea came to my mind from seeing a kid about four years above me uh, called Ben Kornfeld who got into Yale Mm -hmm. to basically uh, look overseas for university. So um, over the years of high school, I basically... Uh, you know, prepared for these overseas universities, did a lot of other things that were very interesting, but among those applied to all these various schools. And then after getting into them, um, lots of my peers uh, were very curious sort of how I got into these programs, uh, what they could have gotten into. Mm. And I met very talented students like my co-founder, Chandre, who I met on this UNICEF tour overseas. uh, I should say model UN tour overseas. And uh, she'd never heard of these opportunities. So I thought, well, you know, um, I could definitely help other students in New Zealand uh, pursue a similar sort of trajectory to my own. And I'm sure there are many students in New Zealand that would love to go to the US or the UK for university and um, you know, do so often with scholarships and things like that. And so that was where the genesis of the idea came from. And I guess my background was a pretty academic one in high school. I loved you know, a lot of my um, studies. And uh, Shine Ray's background, my co-founder, uh, she was a UNICEF Youth Ambassador. She was head girl of her school. And she had a lot of experience working with the youth on leadership projects. Mm. So between her leadership background, my academic background, and also our networks, we had lots of mentors and fr- friends we knew basically that had done competitions with us, things like that. We recruited all of these mentors and then started Crimson, initially um, targeting a very niche market, which basically was you know Auckland students that wanted to head overseas for university. And that was kind of where things got started. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because uh reading an article was like you still had your braces on yet you were still you were knocking on investors doors how did you really develop that courage to do that because it's pretty daunting to go ask someone to fund your idea yeah um it's a really good question actually uh i guess um i had a couple of experiences in my life where just asking for something that wasn't really expected and then um, you know being lucky and kind of being given an opportunity took me a long way. So one that came to mind was after high school, I cold emailed the um, guy that ran the Ice House, which is this business growth center, mm. uh, this guy called Andy Hamilton. And I basically told him, hey, I'm a um, 18 year old, I have no experience apart from working at a Porto's, um, <laughs> but I'd love, I'd love to um, you know, work for you. I've got a lot of skills in math and I can help you with your data analysis. And basically kind of hustled my way into getting this unpaid internship, uh, which was a lot of fun um, at the Ice House and learned a ton. There were lots of experiences like that throughout high school where I tried something that was a bit off the beaten track, like picking up a new subject or, you know, trying a new activity. And I guess that over time built this sort of um, confidence in myself that, you know, if someone says no to me, who really cares? I'll just keep trying with the next person. And, um, you know, many of the best opportunities, I think, in life come where they're not really directly in front of you. You've got to go and sort of bang down some doors. So Mm. a couple of those things in high school kind of built that conviction. Um, And uh, also, I think um, people were very kind in that uh, they saw some potential in sort of what I was up to in high school that, you know, my um, academic success earlier on in uh, in my life. And so they sort of were willing to listen to me. And I think that helped to kind of get the ball rolling. Um, and then I would say there were some strong mentors around. So one of my earliest investors was a lady called Janine Manning. And I met her because she was um, running the Cambridge Association of New Zealand, which is the you know curriculum. And she met me through these various Cambridge awards that I got. And she basically thought that I had some you know good work ethic. And so um, meeting her, she was very supportive of Crimson, wanted to introduce me to other investors, things like that. That gave me the confidence to when I was asked by these US um, Wall Street investors if they, you know, um, could invest in the company or, um, you know, what sure. we were doing, uh, gave me the confidence, I guess, to have those conversations and make it all happen. Yeah. 
Ah, oh, that's that's really interesting because, like, again, you were like what, eighteen, seventeen at the time? Yeah, eighteen. Yeah, eighteen, oh. nineteen. Like another topic I really wanted to talk about, and you know, I told my friends I'm interviewing this ultra successful uh, entrepreneur, and they said, and I asked them like, what what question would you ask them? And the lot of responses I got was, how do you deal with the failures or you know setbacks on the, and those days where you just didn't feel like doing this anymore where you know you just hit and hit H- how do you deal with those days yeah i think it's a brilliant question um i think that basically the most important thing uh is to <clears throat> choose a domain that you really genuinely care about where if you ripped everything else away you know you're still really curious and happy to be involved in and i think um that's the first piece the second piece i would say is some self-awareness so you know um if you have a good understanding of what you think you're good at, what you're bad at, you know, uh, and you believe in yourself and you believe you can add value to the world, then when someone tells you no or someone tells you, you know, can't do that or that's a dumb idea, um, you have the resilience to kind of, you know, push through. I think that if you basically have had lots of failures early on in your life, it, it probably is, uh, you know, demoralizing to get, keep getting told no. So what I think you have to do is you've got to build a bit of self-confidence. And I think how you do that is you find some activities where you can really compete and thrive and do well in and build some, you know, trust in yourself that you really have that, you know, set of skills that mean something. So it could be something silly like, um, or uh, yeah, like winning a young enterprise scheme competition or it could be, you know, starting a new project and, and seeing it through to completion. But um, doing some things that basically, uh, you know, give you confidence in yourself enables you to sort of deal with getting battered down quite a bit. I think the other thing is having people around you that you can kind of, um, you know, talk to. Mm-hmm. If you basically keep, you know, getting told no, and keep getting sort of turned down for ideas, uh, you know, and you're by yourself, it's very demoralizing. I've always done this with my co-founder, Chandra, and a lot of our early team, like Fung Jo, um, who was one of our first students. And so whenever something sort of annoying happens to me or to them, you know, we have this peer support group that kind of keeps each other close. So I think the chance of sort of falling off the rails and being quite demoralized is way higher when you're by yourself. Um, so I think you've got to find that core group. It doesn't need to be big. It can be one person, um, two people, and they can kind of keep you grounded. Um, to make sure you kind of push through. So I'd say, to summarize, self-awareness, mm. self-confidence, and having those peers, usually one or two, that mm. can really you know back you and stand by you. What's an early like failure did you, you had with starting this company or you know whatever you know venture you went ac- across, you know, and how did you sort of overcome that? Yeah, um, I think one thing is you don't have to actually overcome every failure. So one mm. funny failure I had was. In Young Enterprise Scheme, I started this iPad, this company selling iPad stands for yeah, cars. Yeah. So iPads just come out. Uh, shows you that I'm getting a little bit older. <laughs> and um, basically, uh, people wanted to put them inside cars, but there was no way to like do that. So we thought, oh, we'll make these like stands. We'll import them from China. You know, a pretty simple idea. Um, and yeah, we thought it was pretty straightforward, but we were like uh, 17 trying to negotiate with these Chinese like manufacturing companies that like wanted to see, you know, we had like, you know, cash balances and inventory and factories <laughs> and stuff uh, or like, you know, capacity, none of which we had. So um, I guess, you know, we gave it a crack. Absolute failure. We learned a bit, but it, you know, didn't mm-hmm. go anywhere. So I think the first thing is it's totally fine to fail. You just need to fail intelligently. So, you know, everyone's la- enabled to fail, you know, quite a few times in life, but you've got to sort of choose the domains where the repercussions aren't too big. So let's say in high school, I always thought academically, if I had, you know, crappy grades when I was in my last couple of years, that would have the sustained impact where I wouldn't get into good university programs, that would restrict some of my career opportunities, it'd be like quite a a negative uh, recurring cycle, which would be damaging. Mm. So failing in the classroom, I thought was very high stakes. And as a result, um, you know, I put tons of time into that to make sure I I, I really didn't and I was um, doing as well as possible and everything I could. Something like Young Enterprise Scheme, it's experimental. If I fail, it doesn't really matter. It's not going to sort of knock you down. So I think it's important to think about what's mission critical, what you have to nail, and what's more optional, and what can you experiment with. So there's some thoughts around that. In terms of Crimson and some sort of early um, failures we had, um, I mean, I think uh, missed opportunities are a great example of a failure because, you know, if you could have done something faster, that that's sort of, um, you know, could have really helped the situation. So one thing that we did is, we only really started investing heavily in technology about three years into the business. So now if you you know visit our technology team uh, on the other side of Newmarket, you know, we've got a big team of about 25 software engineers working on an online platform. And um, uh, it's very exciting, it's fantastic. If we had built this two years or three years earlier, um, I think we could be even further, even faster, and have an even more exciting you know, product experience. So I think, um, uh, 
yeah, trying to not miss opportunities is, is a big one. And there are lots of people telling me that I should sort of get, you know, start reinvesting into, you know, tech products uh, earlier on in the company's journey, but I, you know, didn't listen and I wanted to, you know, um, keep on the current track. So I think, yeah, there's a good example. Mm, yeah, that's like, it's quite interesting. Could you explain your whole uh, Harvard experience? And, you know, you could, because uh, researching you, you said you were attending Harvard, but also running your company. Yep. How did you sort of do that? Yeah, it's a great question. So I think um, the first thing is, you know, we aren't in like the, I don't know, manufacturing business or something, right? We're in an education, education technology business, which relies on a global network of mentors um, and a good understanding of how universities, careers and, uh, you know, high school curriculum works. So being at Harvard was actually a big competitive advantage in creating Crimson. When I first got there, I was able to actually recruit hundreds of mentors that were the you know first tutors on our platform to be able to deliver our service. So I think what I was doing, being on campus was incredibly useful. The other thing was, um, coming back to Teams, I had basically my co-founder Chandra here in New Zealand, our third mm. key person, Fangjo, in Australia. So we basically weren't in the same place, but between us we had the key bases covered. US, where we were recruiting mentors, Australia and New Zealand, where we had our first two offices. And um, as a team, we were able to basically cover one another. So let's say I was in exam time or something like that. You know, Chandra or Fang Zhao could cover my flack and, you know, simultaneously sort of mm. get through things. The other thing is a lot of the time people assume things are full time or like big commitments when they can be, you know, quite simplified. So I'll give you a good example. Undergraduate degrees, if you actually break out how many hours you actually spend in lectures mm. and how many hours it actually takes to do the work, um, and then how many remaining hours you have in the week, you actually have, you know, usually just tons of time. So it's more like a mental barrier in many cases to think about being able to do multiple things simultaneously. Um, there are many students that maintain full-time jobs working 40 hours a week while they're doing their studies, etc. It's tough, but it's very doable. I've seen the same thing too at business school. People think business school is a full-time program, but if you really focus on just the academics and cut out a lot of the other stuff, it's only sort of 15 hours a week of really heavy-duty stuff. So I would say you need to unpack an opportunity, not assume that it takes more time than it does, and really figure out what do you want out of it. So at Harvard, I was quite deliberate. First semester I came along, I took basically 10 different clubs, you know, all these random activities. Yeah. But then by second semester onwards, I was dropping lots of these activities. And I focused on only a couple. I focused on my academics, um, the finance club I was part of called Black Diamond. Yeah. I focused mm. on an economic association, investing for Tiger, which was a hedge fund, and Crimson. These were my main activities. And I cut everything else out. So I wasn't doing, you know, random like debating or things like that. Um, I had very much, you know, focused in. I think when you're younger, you can sort of spread out more. As you get older, you need to basically specialize, specialize, specialize more and more. But that, that's some, some of my thoughts on that. Mm. Yeah, well, what do you think? Yeah, definitely. Like, I think, you, you know, you, you talked a lot about like, you know, managing that time, you know, managing the time wisely. Yeah. But how does one, you know, how, how do you actually manage your time? What, what steps do you take? Yeah. And, you know, what's the technical ways do you, what things do you use or apps you use, whatever? To do how, it. Yeah, how do you do it? Yeah, so um, I think uh, a couple of things that I do. The first thing is, like, thinking about sleep and the role sleep plays. So mm. um, generally speaking, you know, you can kind of put yourself through the ringer and sleep, like, four hours a night and, like, be really battling. But... A lot, of, a lot of the time, um, you have to be very mentally awake to do a task effectively. So let's say, let's take, let's take an essay or something like that. You could write the essay maybe in five hours, but if you're really sleepy, maybe it'll take you 10 hours. Um, so one thing that I kind of realized pretty quickly is there are some weeks where I have to make sure I'm getting the right sleep. Other weeks, I can have a bit more of a crazy schedule. So let's say that I'm doing an activity which doesn't require much sleep. It requires just hours and work. Then I can basically, then sometimes I'd stay up the entire night and I would basically stay up for mm. like 36 hours. And then I would go ahead and, you know, sleep for like 15 hours and catch up. Um, that's not a very good cycle because basically you, you know, you're quite um, out of it. You don't have a good sleep cycle, things like that. So most of the time I try and maintain, a, you know, pretty consistent seven or eight hours, no matter how hectic things are, because I have the belief that, you know, being very mentally focused is very key. The other thing is I think a little bit of exercise. You don't need to be doing, you know, tons, but whether it be a bit of tennis or some running um, combined with a good sleep, that makes you, you know, probably 30, 50% more focused in, in the day. And I think, you know, the first couple of hours aren't hard to focus. But when you're eight hours into a busy day, um, you know, that's when your inefficiencies and stuff can, can go. So I think there's some basics. The other things that would be um, cutting out things don't matter. So mm. um, let's take things like clothes. <laughs> so um, basically, <laughs> um, I uh, like... 
I mean, you know, you want to look sharp. You know, you want to make sure you're wearing a suit when you're presenting something important, whatever. Mm. But um, if I'm just sort of around the dorm room, like I really don't care sort of what, what I'm wearing. So I'll basically just have a string of T-shirts. I'll have like the same thing like 10 times. And I will, um, you know, make sure that that part of my mind is not occupied thinking. So in the morning, I don't have to wake up and worry about, you know, what am I going to wear today? I can just pull together something very quickly, you know, put it on and get going. Other things would be um, making sure that you have a support network around you. So when you're stuck on, an, on a task, let's say you're stuck on a business problem or you're stuck on an academic challenge, you could sit in the room and get distracted and spend like hours trying to solve it. Or you could plug in and speak to, you know, a tutor or speak to some friend of yours that can basically help you solve the problem quickly. So one thing I realized is that there's some value to struggling on your own, but there's not that much value to it. And so if I'm struggling with something, I will rapidly try and find a way to resolve that problem, whether it be, you know, office hours, a tutor, whether it be a, you know, coach at Crimson or something like that to get things over the line. So there's some things that come to mind. In terms of apps and things, I would uh, use, you know, Google Calendar, you know, pretty basic to schedule my, schedule my time. Um, I think you want to make sure you schedule some free time. Um, because if you just go back to back to back to back, it's very hard to stay on that schedule and it kind of beats you down pretty quickly. So having some free time is important. The other thing I'd say is um, many of the best ideas come from the intersection of different activities. Mm. So being doing Crimson, doing you know Harvard simultaneously, um, uh, I think there were lots of things that I was doing that popped out of that combined experience that helped one another. And also a quick hack that I had was I'd take many classes where I could use Crimson as the sort of project for the class. So let's say you've got a big you know, topic you can do, like a negotiation class. I'd take a Crimson scenario to use for that class, so I'd double up the work. Uh, so um, that yeah, would help to yeah. speed through things a lot. So I'd try and get those efficiencies all the time. Another one was when I was investing at Tiger as a hedge fund analyst, um, I had to learn lots of skills on the job. So I just took all these classes at Harvard that really overlap with that work. So rather than having to learn two different things, I was sort of getting the course credit done at Harvard, but also learning the stuff for the job too. So I think that duplication of, um, you know, uh, things is very useful. So like working smarter, not it, working smart and hard at the yeah. job. I think, I think the best people do, uh, you know, a good combination of both. To be honest, the most, the, the people that are, I think, doing the best in the world, they um, generally speaking are working very hard, but every single hour they're putting in is also a very efficient hour. So y- there are many people in the world, you think of everyone, you know, making, you know, shoes in um, Vietnam or something in like a factory. Now these people are working very hard, but their efficiency in terms of um, you know impact per hour they're doing is not very high. Now, often mm. these people can't control the situation, mm. um, and that's unfortunate. But the point here is you can work very hard but not get very far. Um, the best entrepreneurs not, don't necessarily work the hardest, but they work very intelligently with where they use their time and what's very important. Mm. A good example of this is in business. Typically, great businesses are built on one good product. Um, they're not built on like 15 good products. So focusing on a couple of things that really matter is always much better than spreading yourself too thin. Yeah, that that's like quite interesting because I really like the thing you talked about sleep. Mm. Like, I don't know, we I think we live in a society where we're all sleep, sleep deprived. <laughs> we're like functioning at like sort of half pace. We're not really focused and like even me like sometimes I'm like, "Oh, I could actually if I slept better, mm-hmm. I'd have done this faster. Yeah. I wouldn't be that slow." Yeah. So it's like quite interesting. So, you know, you know talking to you and you know just tracking your success along the years I noticed that you're very, you work really, really hard, but I, I just want to get my head around it. How do you develop such a strong work ethic? I think that one root in it is this fundamental belief that the world's a very competitive place. Mm. And even if you don't think you're competing, you kind of are. So let me give you an example. When you're thinking about, you know, what you want to do in the future, you're actually asking yourself the question of, what domains do I think that I can compete in effectively? What industries can I take my skills to and, and, and basically outcompete others to thrive in that area? So if you want to do law, there's no point really doing law if um, you're not going to thrive as a lawyer. If you can't be an effective lawyer, you're going to be you know, uh, you know, not getting great jobs, not having you know, a good sort of trajectory. Mm. If you take this down to the classroom, you might be sitting in class you know, in year 12 learning some math. Um, you know, there are students all around the world learning the same, you know, or more math than you. And uh, these are the students who will be competing for you in, you know, five years time for the jobs at Facebook and computer science, things like that. So I guess early on, I came to realize that no matter how you look at it, you're almost in like a constant wheel of competition. And you can either get crushed by that, um, you know, mental sort of stress around constantly being in this, um, you know, need for self-improvement, 
or you can embrace it and just say, hey, this is a good opportunity for me to push my limits and challenge myself. And in a business context, even more than a personal context, you're continuously in competition because if you're very successful, people will look at that opportunity and they'll come into your space and try and compete with you. And so I think um, early on, I realized that sustained uh, you know, growth and development is essential to basically uh, be competitive in, in this world and things are only getting more and more competitive. So that, that's what sort of motivates me to keep pushing very hard every day. Uh, a big element to that is also leveling up, which relates back to competition. And when I think about leveling up, it means, you know, if I look at myself this year, am I a better person than what I was last year? Have I learned more things? Am I a more capable leader? Have I learned new skills that will be more effective? If, if the answer is no, something is very wrong. And I think if you, if you ask yourself, have I grown in the last 12 months or the last three months, and the answer is no a couple of times, that's a very bad cycle to be in. So I always want to basically, at the start of every year, zero off everything. I want to be like, okay, what I've done in the last you know, 22 years doesn't matter. I'm starting from scratch again this year. And um, what do I need to do to prove to myself that you know, I still have the you know, execution ability, et cetera. So I think you need to not take what you've done in the past for granted. You need to basically um, always look to the next level ahead. And in, in life, you know, it's a pretty big planet. There's lots of amazing yeah. people. There's always someone doing better than you. And you can always find that person and you know, push hard to learn from them and get to the next level. I think um, no matter how, how you know, hard you push, there's still those people to sort of um, you know, follow and go after. And you know, eventually you can set your own trajectory when you become the master of a field. But I think that you know, um, there's a lot of people you can kind of aspire to and you know, level up looking at. Mm. But don't you think most people see this in the whole idea of competition as like it's a never-ending cycle where you're constantly competing and there's no, n- no end in sight? What, yeah. what do you sort of think about that? Well... <coughs> What I think it's is... It's a big debate. It's a big yeah, debate. Yeah, yeah, for that. sure, for sure. Mm. Um, well, first of all, I think the reality is you are continuously competing. There's really no point in your life where you're mm. done competing because when you basically get to, um, you know, you have a fantastic family, you know, your children now go to school and, you know, you've got to worry about their futures and the whole thing starts again. Um, you know, you have to think about uh, what skills you're learning to stay relevant. So I do think fundamentally the world is a very competitive, continuously competitive place. It doesn't mean you need to be competitive with other people um, all the time. It could be, you know, other ideas or whatever. But generally speaking, it's pretty competitive. So the question is, given the world is continuously competitive for the most part, how are you going to respond to that and what do you enjoy? And one thing I love is, is the journey. I don't really care, like, where things end up that much. Um, it's important as a signal of how well you've done. But the journey itself, you know, the hard work, the process, the, you know, the, the process the, over the, the, the tenacity... Mm. If you can be captivated by that and you can find that very interesting, the competition is kind of fun. Um, the other thing I would say is you want to be in a domain you really care about. So every day when you come to work to compete or you know whatever you'd say, um, you're happy to be there. So it doesn't matter. It could be you know I don't know esports. It could be um, you know competitive <laughs> tennis. It doesn't yeah, matter. Yeah, yeah. Um, you need to find a domain where when you turn up to work and you know the competition is about to start, uh, you know you're happy to be there. And I think that if you don't like the journey it's a very tough place to be. So that's why taking subjects you don't enjoy or starting a business in an industry you're not excited by, these things are very uh, problematic because you will sort of hit a wall. Um, but if you truly love and are excited to compete in that domain, I think you can maintain that intensity for a long period of time. And I think the idea of like burning out, um, yeah, mm. I'd say you burn out when you're doing something you don't fundamentally love, um, you know, uh, or you'll get trapped in a rat where you're not self-improving. I'd say most people that are really enjoying what they do and going hard and leveling up and enjoying the journey, they don't tend to burn out. Um, they tend to kind of keep going. So I think um, I think that is often a manifestation of choosing the wrong domain or um, you know not aligning what you're doing with your values, things like that. But um, yeah. Hmm. So so what keeps you motivated, or you know why do you do the things you do and work so hard? Yeah, I think um, uh, first of all. In my own life, um, my education plays such a transformative role in, you know, I guess uh, my, my journey, my upskilling, what enabled me to, um, you know, do a lot of things in entrepreneurship. And so I really feel that um, the more students that I can support through Crimson, through whatever channel we're providing that support, um, and I think there's so many structural problems with the school system that we really have an obligation at Crimson to help correct, support, address, enhance students, you know, welfare all around the world. It's a very motivating goal because there are, you know, billions of students around the world, you know, millions that we can directly support with our existing products. And um, I think, you know, there's always more we can do and more innovation to bring. The other thing that's very motivating to me is if you think about it like this, when you get up every day, you look around the street, look around the buildings around you, you know, someone, some human decided to build that street, put in place that building, design that company, 
Nothing sort of came from, you know, um, thin air and just materialized. Everything was constructed by somebody. And so I think it's very important to view the world around you as something you can control, something you can change, something you can play an impact in, you know, in developing. And if you take that mindset to looking at problems, when you think about a domain like education, when you see a problem, you know, rather than sort of, you know, um, writing it off or, you know, complaining about it, you can try and find an innovative way to tackle that problem and take on that kind of responsibility yourself. So I think you've got to find your own mission. For me, you know, that's an education. I'm really excited by that. You know, for somebody else, it might be in personal fitness. It might be in, you know, consumer technology. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, as long as you find that motivating mission and you, you know, have that growth mindset and, you know, sort of willingness to try and solve these big problems, I think it's very engaging. Mm. One thing I really like you talking about is like the whole educational system mm. and that's like coming on to the next question. What do you think is wrong with New Zealand's educational system? Yeah, so I go to school at the moment and yeah, I do see a lot of flaws, but I just want to hear your thoughts and perspective on it. Yeah, so the first thing I'd say is um, there are a lot of people in the government and teaching in schools that really care about doing a great job. People devote their entire career to making the school system fantastic. So. I think it's all well and good to sort of, you know, um, criticize its problems, but I think we do have a, you know, incredible foundation in New Zealand um, and in many countries around what we're offered. So I think that in general, education is uh, not something to be sort of um, belittled because it's taken a long time to get to where we are. In saying that, you know, there are some big problems. So a couple of things that come to mind. One would be the process of career counseling. So when you're in high school, you have to make these high stakes choices about your future. You've got to decide what to study in university, in high school, which links to what degrees you can do, which links to what jobs you can get. Mm. You've got to make all those choices with what knowledge, the knowledge of maybe your parents, a couple of friends, maybe a teacher that cares for you. But the world is a massive place, it's changing very quickly. Students are traveling all around the world for various opportunities, whether it not be in their degrees, but in their future careers. To make those choices right, or to at least make the best possible bet, you need a lot of information and support. And the way schools are structured today, you have usually one career counselor for like a thousand students. That career counselor is supposed to know something about everything. That means they basically aren't an expert at any one thing. And so inevitably you get a lot of very generic advice, often telling you to do things like stay locally for university, you know, take the subjects everyone else is taking. That leads to basically people getting pushed to be you know, more same rather than different. And I think uh, people's potential gets undermined by that kind of structure. So I would say the lack of access to really future thinking, innovative career advice is a big problem. The second problem that I would say is quite systematic is the structure of classrooms. So many students sit in class and for many hours of the day, they're pretty unengaged. You know, they sort yeah, of, they're engaged for like 10 minutes and they start to drift off and then they're waiting, looking at the clock, waiting for lunch <laughs> to start, you know. Um, even, my, even, like, even though I love learning, it happens to me a lot, even in high school. So when I was thinking about um, uh, yeah, the school system, I guess, fundamentally, if you've got 20 people in a class and one teacher, Someone in that class is going to be really above average. Someone's going to be really below average. And the person who's below average is going to be struggling and they're going to be basically, you know, finding it very depressing, very challenging, and they won't be getting enough contact hours to really stay above. The people that are very above the curve are going to be finding themselves bored, finding themselves slowed down, finding that class, you know, kind of a waste of time in terms of their progress. Mm. So I think that the more we can shift the school system from a static, almost like factory of, you know, classes and teachers to a very personalized environment where you can have many one-on-one -on -one interactions, either with mentors or with AI or with digital content that enables you to really take charge of your own learning trajectory, you can go a lot faster. And students can basically move through levels um, based on their ability and competency, rather than whatever generic rules, you know, one government minister made like five years ago about, you know, what year you can yeah. do what. So I think that second thing around personalization and the lack of attention in the school system to the individual is a second big problem. I think the final problem is teachers uh, in terms of um, the ability to attract, you know, fantastic talent to the teaching industry. There are many incredible teachers who really give it their all, but on average in New Zealand, um, you know, teachers college is one of the uh, lowest entrance requirements for any of the main university degrees. So teaching is so fundamentally important to our society, but it's very hard to attract many of society's, you know, sharpest talent into this industry systematically. Mm. You know, you ask these, you know, great minds, they want to go into medicine or they want to go into law or they want to go into commerce um how many of you know new zealand's you know sharpest minds are saying i want to go into education that's a big problem because education is really the future of you know the country and and yeah. uh, our young people and so i think having models where you have to be a teacher for your full-time job and that's it is very restrictive in our model for example at crimson you know you could be 
an investment banker at Goldman Sachs, New York, and you could be teaching online on our platform for four hours a week, giving insight, giving career guidance. You're not normally going to be a teacher, but you're very happy to give those insights. So we can tap into those kind of expert minds, even if they're not willing to be teachers full time. And I think that, you know, there are other challenges around how teachers have got to go through this complicated teacher's college, but then, you know, uh, you often come across teachers who haven't even sat the exams they teach and they've just like, you know, the, the smartest kid in the class knows more than the teacher does yeah. about the subject, these kind of challenges. So I think fundamentally the ability to attract and retain good teachers is also a problem. So there, there I would say the three big ones, career counselors, lack of personalization of schools and lack of access to good quality teachers. Yeah, but don't you think like school is a great place to learn social skills? Like there's a lot of fundamental skills that you can't really learn. You can learn, but it's harder to learn outside of school. Like, you know, uh, playing sports and learning how to be in a team or uh, learning how to communicate. Don't you think these skills are vital? And if we did move to that whole AI schooling, that virtual school, we'd sort of lose that? 100%. Now, I don't advocate for fully virtual schooling. Mm. Um, I think blended, like a blended mix where you have some physical experiences, some online experiences is very valuable. I think that doing projects together in person, you know, sitting across the room from somebody and working together with them has a lot of value. Um, but I want to break apart social experiences from, you know, the parts of school that aren't really like that. When you go into a classroom and you have 25 kids and everyone's sitting there looking at their computer or, you know, the table and scratching away and sort of like, you know, not paying attention. You're not really building social skills in that environment, right? Mm. Social skills are often built on the sports field, you know, in the extracurricular clubs, over lunchtime, you know, uh, in the presentations in front of other students, um, in, you know, in the parties on the weekend. So social interactions come from having this peer group you can work with and various things. Social interactions often don't come from the actual classroom experience themselves that much. And so I think Often social skills is used as a sort of excuse to get away with a pretty, you know, weak school system mm. um, when, uh, you know, you can get many of those aspects of schooling from you know, other areas. So, for example, you know, how valuable was it for you to meet interesting people, you know, doing your podcasts and, you know, working with people at your school on this project? That's very enriching for your social skills, that kind yeah. of thing, much more so than sitting in English, you know, you know, sort of discussing an essay. So I think... Um, I believe social skills are immensely important. They're also one of the things that you actually can't replace with AI. Interpersonal skills, being able to build that rapport, that's very hard to do by a robot or something like that. You need people to do that. You need mentors. You need teachers. Makes a lot of sense. But, um, you know, there needs to be awareness as to where the social skills are actually built and where they're not, and then, you know, not sort of blur the line and sort of make an excuse for where there's weaknesses in the school system. Mm. So with that, where do you think the, the whole school system would go in the future? Yeah, so um, right now we're actually working with uh, the top international school in China, which has about seven campuses and 7,000 students, to provide a, bl a totally blended learning experience. So students come to school, they go to these classes physically, but they can also tap into this network of virtual mentors all around the world. So mm -hmm. these kids are learning entrepreneurship, negotiating, coding online by mentors that are only a couple of years older than them in group classes where they can basically have only three or four students in a class um, alongside you know, their core subjects taught in the school. They still have all the sports and those activities, but they also have this network, the global network of support. For career counseling, they can tap into mentors in all these different countries to figure out what these different industries would look like. So I think in the future, we'll see schools that are a blended mix of online access to you know, resources, such as mentors, digital content, and then um, you know, in-person uh, interactions for some certain areas. I think that many of the classroom experiences um, you know, will be made more and more and more online centric. And, you know, uh, the physical classroom experience will be used more for like collaborative problem solving or um, team projects, things like that, where the interactions are actually taking place. So I think we're going to see the shift towards more and more and more digital learning, enabling the online, uh, the offline. I think that, you know, some students will want to do totally online learning, but the significant majority will want to mix. They want to have a combination of physical school where they can see their buddies and an online experience to let them, you know, learn from anywhere, learn at the rates they want, and not be restricted by whatever teachers are around their school. Mm, uh, yeah, so that's that's quite interesting. What what skills do you think, or you know, in the future right now, what skills do you think are the most important at the moment, or in the future? Yeah, so I think um, the first skill that I would say is just um, uh, just crucially important is uh, is math. So. Um, no matter what field you look at, whether it be you know companies like SpaceX, Facebook, Snapchat, Tesla, whether you work in operations, running a school, whatever, 
you've got to have a good sense of math to be able to, you know, really do all the statistics and the analysis required to run a lot of these different projects and that kind of thing. Whether it be AI, computer science, physics, whether it be finance, a math foundation provides that critical underpinning to be able to achieve all those different areas. So I think math is a very important skill set. Even if you don't want to go very deep into it, it's very important to have good foundations. I think that's very key. The second one I would say is uh, interpersonal skills. So being able to speak, communicate, convince, articulate, these things are crucial. In a business, no matter how you know great you are at coding or something, at some stage you've got to convince some human whether or not your project's a good idea. You could have mm. the best coding skills, but if you can't you know, connect with somebody and express how you feel about the world to them, you're going to struggle. So I think interpersonal skills, secondly, is pretty huge. Uh, and linking to that, I would say, you know, particularly persuasion, sales, a very valuable skill. If you're an entrepreneur, you yeah. need to be able to convince investors to believe in you, convince your clients to trust you, convince your staff to work for you. It's a constant game of persuasion and helping everybody you know, feel confident in that vision. So I think that interpersonal component uh, is very key. The third thing I would say is um, creative problem solving. As more and more sort of AI technology comes around, you know, truck drivers' jobs are automated, accounting jobs are automated, basic law jobs are automated, you know, uh, you need to become more and more and more creative to basically be um, able to sustain your job. You need to be able to see things that, you know, um, very efficient, you know, uh, AI can't, can't do. And that requires the ability to connect dots that are, you know, hard to see. It requires you to be able to think laterally. And so I think to build those creative skills, you need to do things like, case competitions you know do things like take very different subjects maybe learn a musical instrument so i think that mm. cr that, that creative skill is um uh, very important to develop sitting at the intersection of ideas so i'd say math um interpersonal skills particularly persuasion and sales and then i would say that creative thinking where you can spot opportunities outside of the box these are three kind of key foundations mm. yeah that's that's definitely interesting which industries or you know sectors do you think are the most growing and, and interesting places to work because like a lot of my peers like i'm year 13 this year and i'm looking at these career opportunities and i'm like Shit, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of things out there but what do you think you know being in this entrepreneurial area and like meeting a lot of different people which areas do you think are like interesting but also booming that's a great question so I would say there's a question of um, what industries are booming and then what types of jobs are booming. Because mm. um, sort of you could be an accountant in Tesla and it, you know, maybe you're still not booming. Mm. So um, I think uh, a couple of things that come to mind. One of my best friends from high school actually just got a job at DeepMind um, at Google, which is the artificial intelligence team. Mm. They recently beat chess. Um, so they, they beat the world's best grandmasters of playing chess um, using this AI technology. Now, my friend is, uh, you know, just finished university, you know, in his early 20s like me, um, you know, started work at DeepMind, um, and it's going to be the most, you know, fascinating work. So he's going to be working on AI safety, how you can build artificial intelligence um, that has limitations and precautions to, you know, prevent sort of, you know, risks. Um, it's almost very like Terminator-esque if you've watched <laughs> Terminator. So anyway, um, not only is this job uh, very stimulating, it's incredibly well paying because the set of experiences my friend needs to do this job sits at the intersection of math, philosophy, physics, computer science, and only that combination can you do that job properly. So it's a very in-demand skill set. So I would say um, there's just a soaring demand for data scientists, artificial intelligence, um, expertise, you know, computer science, statistics, math. These are some of the areas that are just surging in demand. I'd say things that are sort of falling behind a little bit would be things like law a little bit because basically... There are so many people coming out with law degrees, and law is very useful, um, but it does, uh, you know, it's very country specific, and you learn a set of analytical skills, um, but, uh, you know, not really with the precision of, say, math, and you don't need, like, infinite lawyers, um, ultimately. Uh, you need people that can think analytically, and law does help you for that, but what we're seeing across the world is, in New Zealand and the US, is that many law degrees are actually providing a worse return on investment mm. than, uh, you know, people will think getting into them. So I think sort of some of these humanity fields like law are kind of going down quite a bit. Other areas that I think are very interesting um, are areas like uh, finance. Um, why finance is very exciting for an entrepreneur is because ultimately any idea in the world needs to be um, brought to life through capital. It needs you know, money to hire a team, to build the product, to you know, do the marketing. And you know, the best idea sort of sits in a corner and no one hears about it until capital comes around it to enable it to grow. 
As someone in finance, your job is to help select the best ideas, to empower ideas to reach the world, and then you're often rewarded when your ideas successfully do so. So I think as a, as a person working in finance, you have to think about risk reward, think about opportunities, think about you know, what ventures make sense, and it provides mm. you a, a, a toolkit to quantify opportunity. So I think as an entrepreneur, um, those finance skills are very valuable, and that industry will always be quite defensible, um, particularly at the high end, where it's very creative and you've got to think about industry inflection points and things like that. So I'd say I'm very bullish on data science, finance, artificial intelligence, and I'm you know, losing my confidence in, say, you know, the value of doing like a law degree. Yeah, that's that's yeah, that's an eye opener as well. So, so for someone that's listening and they want to start their own company or they start they want to start their own business and they want to be an entrepreneur, what key things do they you know that you want to share to them just starting off? Yeah, um, the first thing that I would think about is almost anything you try and do becomes incredibly complicated very quickly. And so it's important to st stay very, very simple at the start. Um, remember, any of the big apps we use on our phone, they have usually 100 plus software engineers working away on them, you know, big marketing teams to get there. Um, so initially, you want to really ask, you know, what can I start that's very simple? What can I do to validate this idea very cheaply? And uh, how can I build some initial kind of traction? Because you can get a lot of support quickly. The world's got plenty of capital, plenty of investors, pe plenty of people willing to bet on big ideas, but they want to see proof that there's some success before they put in their money. And so I think um, being able to create realistic prototypes that you can then you know, sell uh, or build some traction off quickly is very important. Um, and I think to do that, you need to find a niche market. And to find this niche market, you have to ask yourself, you know, off my set of skills or products that I'm trying to build, who can I serve that most cares about this product? Initially for me, that was high school students at my former high school that wanted to head overseas. There was probably like 15 kids in the year below me that qualified for that very, very niche market. Mm. But um, I initially got some results, some traction, some testimonials, and that kind of got the ball rolling. Um, if you're selling like, a, like an app, for example, uh, then getting downloads um, and getting people to give mm. you user feedback, for example, would be, would be a good one. But I think... Uh, I'd say focus on a very, very small niche single pain point. Um, if your app needs to be too complicated, you'll probably miss something because the most you know, prescient pain points are often solved by only a couple of key things. Yeah. So um, that's some of the tips that I would give. Um, and also I'd say you know, make sure you surround yourself with people that will challenge you because if you just sort of have like a bunch of people around you that will tell you your idea is great, like maybe your parents um, you know, or, your, or your friends or something like that, um, you're going to spend a lot of time chasing sort of you know dumb you know dumb ideas. It's all right to do, but you want to make sure that you have um, people around you that will challenge you early on, so you don't basically you know spend time going down dead avenues. Mm. That's interesting. I just turn on the lights as well. Uh, so, yeah, what what do you think is the biggest myth about entrepreneurship? It's uh, an interesting question. Um, I would say like the biggest myth about entrepreneurship is you have to actually be running a company to be entrepreneurial. Um, you know, the majority of the world works inside a company. And uh, in the US, for example, entrepreneurship in terms of actually starting a company from scratch is actually declining. Um, and that's totally fine because you don't need to start your own company to be entrepreneurial. I think that whether or not you're, if you're say, let's say you're a student and you're at high school and you see that your school doesn't have a computer science club or it doesn't have a mod UN club and you care about those things it's very entrepreneurial to go ahead and start that yourself build those skills and develop that traction the people that have you know the billion dollar business of tomorrow often were being pretty entrepreneurial and scrappy early on in their life several years before so I think um, uh, you, you don't need to think that you know you got to be a run a company to be an entrepreneur you can very much go ahead and do what I'd call micro entrepreneurship or, or intra entrepreneurship or entrepreneurship I should say where you're working inside an organization like a school, a community, whatever, and you're the one driving the ideas, driving the agenda. Um, and I think the other thing that I would say is, um, you know, all these great entrepreneurs, like, say, Elon Musk, he doesn't think of all the ideas for Tesla. He builds a rock star team that helps to drive that, you know, vision forwards. So, you know, as an entrepreneur, you don't need to think of all the best ideas. You don't need to think of you know, every single solution. But you need to be able to draw on a set of people that will help you enable those solutions. So, um, I think, uh, yeah, there's a bit of a myth that entrepreneurs need to be able to do everything. I think they just need, need to be able to do some things well and need to know what they're bad at to be able to ask for help. Mm. Yeah, so, so if someone's like, you know, thinking about starting a business, what's, 
you know, how, how do they come up with the ideas and how do they, because I think, you know, we all know that entrepreneurship is find a problem and find ways to solve that problem. And, you know, maybe in doing so, you start a company or business. How does someone uh, find a problem or find a creative solution? Yeah, so I think um, the first thing is that, um, you know, the majority of companies that start today, they aren't new ideas. Somewhere, some in some country, this thing's been tried before. And maybe it didn't work for various reasons, maybe cultural background, maybe um, the technology wasn't there, etc. But it's very rare you see an idea and it's truly unique uh, and fresh from the start. Particularly when you're a student and you don't have like, you know, millions of dollars to invest in technology or something like that, it's very hard to build something for the very first time. So what I think is very important is pattern recognition, which means seeing opportunities in other countries that are working effectively and how you can basically mimic or change or imitate or um, you know, adapt that idea and bring it to your country. A lot of great ideas and opportunities come from that. A good example is Kiwi over here in New Zealand. So when Kiwi opened like Mission Bay, it was like some sort of you know, lunatic craze. You know, it was all over Instagram, uh, people were loving it and it was a nationwide sensation. The funny thing is it was a nationwide sensation seven years before that in the US. So, you know, um, many of the best ideas in, say, New Zealand, um, you know, have been tried in other markets or vice versa. Many ideas that maybe haven't even tried in America yet, you know, were tried here. So I would say as an entrepreneur, the first thing you should do is read very generally. Be constantly thinking about ideas, what models are working, what models are successful, what things aren't working, why aren't they working. Um, so that's very important. Uh, another sort of interesting, you know, thing that I would say is it's important to know what things don't work and why because if that if you have a framework of what doesn't work you can kind of cut out bad ideas quickly one example is in the u.s there are these online course companies called like coursera or udemy yeah and these things have grown quite big but um you know when they first were growing that people thought they'd be like huge like taking over the world kind of huge and um uh what people quickly realized is that people don't really want to finish online courses so like people will often start them but there'll be very high attrition rates and so only a small portion of people actually finish the whole class and so what I quickly realized in building an education company is that people don't really want to pay for purely video content. People don't want to learn through purely video content. And so that was, for example, like a, a concept that I discovered and that helped me to cut out bad ideas quickly. So when someone pitches me an idea from this kind of domain, I've got you know, a bunch of evidence that I can use to kind of quickly filter that idea. And I think as an entrepreneur, that's very important. Um, in terms of actually where to find your first idea, I would say um, look for pain points you, you're familiar with yourself. Let's say you like fishing and you keep seeing a stupid problem where, I don't know, you have to fill up these fish and it's very messy or something like that. I don't know. Let's say that, you know, you find it very difficult to, um, you know, get your car serviced because of where you live. All kinds of problems come up in your daily life that probably are repeatable all around the world. And so many of the best innovations, like, say, transportation with Uber, come from something that people can probably see. Like, what if I could, um, you know, just call a car from my phone rather than having to call a car company and wait 10 minutes? So, um, yeah, I'd say look very curiously around the world around you and keep your eyes open. It's very hard to think of an idea sitting in a room, but sitting at the bus stop, you know, uh, going about your daily life, you know, eating some um, food and, you know, reflecting on how the world's working, that's when opportunities, I think, come from. So I think the best entrepreneurs are constantly curious and paying attention to the world around them. Mm. So just a sharp turn is like, how significant has your mentors or teachers been and how do you actually you know, approach mentors and, uh, you know, network with them to help you on ideas or, you know, help you personally with your journey across whatever you're doing? So first of all, I would say, like, my mentors have been absolutely fundamental to um, our success at, at Crimson and, you know, earlier on in my sort of academic um, journey. Basically, uh, yeah, I think it's very hard to know a lot about really anything by yourself. And having guidance from those, you know, wise and more knowledgeable than you is super important. The best people in the world that are very successful that, you know, basically go through things quickly have a network of people around them helping give them advice and feedback and ideas. Um, people that try and do it themselves will often very much struggle. So um, I think a key thing to uh, think about when it comes to, you know, um, uh, thinking about mentors is that mentors enable you to accelerate the learning curve, to go faster than you would go by yourself. I think that's very valuable. Um, what was the other part of your question? How do you find someone uh, oh, to yeah, yeah. you? How do you find them? Oh, yeah, so here's, here's a good tip. Basically, people are very nervous to ask, but people love to be asked for help. You know, if someone asks me for something, 
it's very rare that I'll be like, no, I can't, can't help you. Or I don't want to help you. Um, for the most part, uh, when you ask someone for help, they're very responsive. And so I would say 99% of people just don't ask for enough help. You know, if you take active interest and go and ask your teacher for help outside of class or you, you know, ask that, you know, friend of yours dad to tell you about, you know, how uh, his, you know, IT firm works, whatever, um, they're often very, very keen to go out of the way to help. So I developed a very big network of mentors by asking tons of questions and always asking for help. So I'm not, not afraid to ask someone about, oh, that's very interesting. How does that work? Oh, could you give me some tips on that? I'd really appreciate that. You can often build great relationships. And, you know, you can say that you can help everybody else and they're going to start helping you. But it's hard to know what everyone else needs help with. So often I'd say start with yourself, ask for help, then find ways to be valuable to those around you. And then you can build a mentor from that. But um, people respond well to being asked and they're very willing to give. So, you know, generally speaking, if I ask 10 people for something, I don't know, seven or eight will try and help me. So, um, and I try and do the same in reverse. So, I, yeah, I think constantly asking is a good way to do it. Mm, yeah. yeah. It's quite interesting. Like, now you're a CEO of your own company. When someone applies, you know, to work for you or generally to work for any company, what things do you look at? Or do you have a specific team looking in that? Yeah, so... Um, I would say like uh, a good CEO's job is 40% recruiting. You know, mm. I spend a huge portion of my time trying to bring in the top leaders for the company that can help drive our growth for the future. And um, we have a big, you know, recruiting team, HR team, and that's all great. But I think fundamentally it's the job of every leader to basically constantly be on the prowl for great talent. In terms of some of the things that I look for, the first thing is probably, um, you, know, uh, you know, raw intellectual curiosity. People don't need to have the, you know, best grades, but people, um, although that's usually a good sign, but people need to be really um, responsive to improvement because you could hire someone who's an A player for the role you have right now, but if the company evolves, the role evolves, and they can't really change very quickly, they're going to quickly become dead weight, you know, or baggage in your, in your company. So you want to maintain a team of people that are as passionate about leveling up personal growth, development, the next challenge as you are, or at least as close as possible to that. So I think that growth mindset or curiosity or intellectual, you know, kind of flexibility is the first and more, you know, most important point. The second thing is cultural alignment to our values. So, um, you know, uh, for example, one of our values is that uh, when our students crush it, we crush it, which basically means that only when our students are thriving is Crimson going to do effectively. So every single person that walks through our doors needs to be someone that genuinely cares about education and our students' well-being. And I think having that shared passion for the student's journey is something that brings the whole company together. So I like to see people that have really you know, had an intimate experience with education in their own life. It's been personally connected with them in some way, um, and they can kind of have evidence of that. I think the third thing um, you know, uh, would be um, you know, demonstrated um, you know, core skills and something that we need, which is sort of the most basic thing. So whether it be if we need a Salesforce engineer, Salesforce skills, whether it be a digital marketing person, someone that's done digital marketing before. So, you know, experience is always, you know, uh, nice to have. Um, but many of the best people in our company, we have a guy running our Mosque, our Russian team at Crimson, which is one of our fastest growing uh, regions, um, who's 20. Um, you know, uh, we have people that run, say, uh, other regions that are in their late 30s or 40s. Um, you know, the 20-year-old, you know, beats many of them regularly in terms of how fast the region is growing that he's running. So... I think that you don't always need to go for the people with the most experienced, um, but you know, it does help sometimes. Mm. What advice would you give to like people that are struggling and you know they're just seeing failure and failure, like they're not doing that well in school or you know things are just not working out for them? What sort of what's something you would tell them to snap out of it? Right. To snap out. Yeah. 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 I think it's a it's a very good question. Um, I think a lot of the time when people are experiencing like sustained failure. Um, you know, there's often a problem like uh, coming back to their passion or their actual interest. So I think for all of these people, I ask them, you know, what do you really want to do in the future? What kind of ideas do you have? What gets you excited? And I think if you can draw a connection between what you want to do in the future and the path today that gets you there, that's very enabling for people. Mm. So often I meet these students who want to start businesses, but, you know, they're just chilling in math, you know, chilling in accounting, like, you know, they don't want to be at school because what's the point? Because they just want to start a business. I often tell these students that if you look at the people that you know run the world's biggest companies or the most successful entrepreneurs, many of them have done very well academically for a long period of time. And um, if they want to be prepared for this future, they need to be very capable to learn quickly. Mm. And the school might not be the best proxy for how fast you can learn, but it's a pretty good one. And so I think if you can help people connect, 
their future to what they're doing right now and find that pathway that kind of you know ties everything together people often have a big uptick in motivation so i think many students that are sort of you know struggling and failing and failing and failing a lot don't have that clear connection between today and at least their vision for the future if you can help make that vision clear then you know your motivation to get up every day go a bit harder is a lot higher the other thing i'd say is probably don't want to shoot too far in the future you know having connections that are only you know i've got a plan now for something four years in the future that's quite motivating but something trying to you know shoot 30 years in the future it's a bit hard to visualize no nah, that's definitely true because like i do have a lot of mates that you know they want to do well they really genuinely want to do well but they just ha- they just haven't had that kickstart or they just don't know what to do well in yeah because i think you know n- no one's lazy they just haven't found the right motivation or you know intent behind it because if you give them that right motivation and you have the right idea or what you really want to do, people would go, you know, up and beyond to do that. Yeah, so for yeah. sure. And I mean, I've seen this time and time again. I see someone who was just unengaged in a particular subject go ahead and try like a launch a company or do a new project and find a passion in it and just put in so much time into it. You know, I've seen, uh, you often see this in terms of the work ethic of people um, who uh, you know, they're going through high school and they were sort of drifting and then they found their sweet spot in real estate sales or something like that. And they just have super high work ethic. So I think everyone has the ability to work hard. It's just a matter of aligning, you know, passion and purpose and, and understanding how it connects to the future and doing it right now. And so if you are kind of confused, you just need to actively spend time working on yourself to figure out what you care about and whether or not what you're doing right now actually links to that goal. That, that's just the most important thing. Mm, no, that's definitely true. So we'll just do some quick fire questions. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite books and why? Um, I would say Peter Thiel, Zero to One. Mm. It's a very good book which describes how to build basically revolutionary companies and the traits required. Uh, and he basically talks about how it's very important to um, you know, try and grow a business that is so powerful in the advantage it provides its customers that you can generate almost like a monopoly in terms of its scale. So Uber, for example, is kind of like an effective monopoly in transportation in many of its areas. For those so, who don't know what a monopoly is. Oh, a, a monopoly is a, uh, is a business that has the whole market. So basically all consumers need to go to that company. So if you want to get transportation in New Zealand um, on demand, you have to use Uber. Uh, there's no sort of alternatives. And I think the most revolutionary businesses are so profoundly better than the status quo that everyone wants to use them and it's hard for competitors to catch up. Like Netflix, there's so much content out there um, in many parts of the world that it's hard to sort of challenge them because you know they just have so much volume. I think that's, for example, a very interesting business. So yeah, Peter Thiel Zero to One describes the framework to think about what it takes to build a great business. And no business starts off huge and disruptive at the start, um, but it provides a framework to help attack that problem. Mm, no, that's definitely a, a good one to read. A good one to read. Zero when, to one. when you hear the word successful, uh, what's the first person that comes to mind and why? Um, yeah, I guess I would probably think about um, Mark Zuckerberg. The reason why is because, you know, Mark has built a huge company that is transforming the lives of, you know, millions of people, billions of people. Now, uh, he actually had no idea how to run a company at the start. He had mm. to learn it over the course of 10 plus years. And he was a pretty, you know, rough leader at the start. But he kept training and coaching and coaching and developing and developing. And he stayed relevant, even though his companies got into this massive scale. So I think um, you know people that have been able to continuously grow themselves while the adventure is growing is very inspiring to me. And he's a very good example of doing so. Mm. Sweet. Before we get to the last question, where could people find you? <laughs> um, well, uh, I guess you can email me, um, but I do a lot of YouTubing. Um, we have a big Crimson Hub YouTube channel, and I try mm. and put out some content there. Um, yeah, so Facebook, YouTube, Sweet. find me an email. Sweet as... What's the impact you want to leave in the world? Um, I think I really want to fundamentally transform how students learn. I want to make sure students are learning um, efficiently, effectively to enable them to really unlock their full potential. I don't want people just sitting around in classrooms unsatisfied, wasting time when they could be chasing that potential, that hustle, that, you know, that dream they have. So I want to be able to create an education infrastructure for the world that really helps them to you know, hit those goals. And I think uh, you know, uh, my mark in the world will be left only when students all around the world um, you know, fundamentally feel the education system is working for them um, mm-hmm. and you don't have, you know, huge pockets that are dissatisfied. So that's really my, my goal. Yeah, that's pretty incredible. That's, that's pretty big. Any parting thoughts you want to leave with the listeners? Um, 
uh, get those eight hours of sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Cheers, Jamie. Thanks awesome. for being on the show. Cheers. Appreciate it. Thank Cheers. you. Very oh, good. good.